and um, I guess um, uh, our moderator can can um, uh, introduce everybody. And um, well, uh, I just want to point out how important it is for us to uh, mm, explain the seriousness of this case in Europe, uh, because uh, um, our main point is that Europe is investigating the, ca the Pegasus espionage uh, in um, other countries like Poland and Hungary, but uh, they are not investigating properly these cases in Spain. And this is for us especially serious since uh, the Catalan Gate has been the, the case with most evidence, the case cases and, and, and uh, targeted people with this software. Um, so without delay, I, I would prefer to pass uh, to Laura Cabelka, our moderator, the introduction and, and moderation of this round. Thank you very much, Laura. Great, thank you. Uh, well, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the session on Catalan Gate, an example of massive cyber espionage. I assume you all already know why we're here today. Um, as earlier this year was revealed that over 60 Catalan journalists, politicians, activists, but also lawyers were spied upon uh, massively and the news just don't stop coming in. There will be more cases in more countries. So today we have the chance to hear from uh, two uh, victims of these massive attacks on um, privacy. So let me introduce you to Elisenda Palusie, uh, former uh, president of the Catalan Assembly and victim of espionage with Pegasus. Joining us online, we have David Fernandez, journalist and social activist, also um, victim of Pegasus. And with you today in presence also is Chloe Bertelemy, who is an expert in digital rights, working for EDRI, the European Digital Rights Association that is advocate, advocating for digital rights across Europe. So, um, as I said, we will hear both about personal experiences, but also try to in, embed them in a broader context um, to see where we stand in Spain, but also the EU more largely. We will also hear about policy recommendations, to hopefully improve the situation for civil society and journalists in particular. So um, just for the program, we will have our three speakers give a, an intervention of about 10 minutes. Then uh, we will go into questions and we will also open it up for you to ask questions if you already want to think of uh, something also online. So um, Elisenda, let's start with you. Could you give us um, a short view of your experience and also the broader context of what happened? Uh, thank you, Laura. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be back in Brussels to explain this Catalan Gate case. Um, most of you already know it, but probably some of the audience um, don't. And I think it's important to keep on raising awareness of what happened and what is still happening in, in Catalonia uh, uh, with regards to political espionage. So as uh, Laura already said, uh, Citizen Lab, a uh, research center in Canada, um, proved that 65 people belonging to the Catalan pro-independence movement had, had been targeted or attacked with Pegasus and Candiru, 63 of them with Pegasus and four with Candiru. Uh, among, among them, we had four presidents of the Catalan government, two presidents of the Catalan parliament, two other cabinet members of the Catalan government, 31 MPs of the Catalan parliament or Spanish parliament or leaders of political parties, three members of the European parliament, three lawyers of the political prisoners or the exiles nine members of the civil society associations, uh, the ANC, my own association, and Omnium Cultural, Davi, uh, where David is now sitting in the board. Uh, two spouses um, of political prisoners and exiles. Two, uh, and the parents, this is a, a case that is, I think it's worth uh, um, highlighting. Um, the parents of uh, an engineer, um, that was not targeted directly because he lives, we think that it is because he lives in the US, Elias Campo, but his parents that are doctors, medical doctors working at the University of Barcelona and the hospital clinic were uh, attacked, uh, both his mother and his father. And five open source and digital voting experts. 
uh, this is also worth looking at what they are looking for because uh, as you as you know um, and as this um, thing here shows uh, Spain is um, considering self-determination and the organization of a referendum as a crime not as a right so probably they are worried about us organizing another referendum uh, through digital means so digital voting experts were also were also attacked with Pegasus um, in what concerns my own organization the ANC is the largest single issue pro-independent social movement in Catalonia with 45,000 members and 50,000 sympathizers. Uh, it is a legal and democratic association and it has been the organizer of the largest demonstrations in Europe in the last 10 years. It was created 10 years ago. Um, among us, two former two presidents were infected uh, during their service. Uh, my predecessor, Jordi Sánchez, in the period 2015-2017, prior to the referendum. Uh, myself, uh, I was attacked four times, and there's one infection that has been proved in, the, in, in 2019 and 2020. Uh, and then two other members of the board and one activist. Um, well, what has been done since that report by Citizen Lab that was published in a, on April 18th this year, what has been done since then? Uh, first of all, uh, it is worth mentioning that the Spanish Parliament refused, rejected, to create uh, an inquiry committee. Uh, the, the only political measure that was taken was the resignation of the director of the secret services, but not that of the minister of defense. And then the second thing that was done was a meeting of the committee of official secrets in the Spanish parliament. In this mm, committee that is secret, uh, the minister of defense recognized that out of the 65, uh, people, 18 of the victims were authorized to be spied on by the Supreme Court on the grounds of national security. The names had to be kept secret, but finally they were leaked to the, to the press. So uh, we, we don't have any confirmation or any official communication, just what we saw published in newspapers. Um, as regards the judiciary, what are the actions that we have been taking uh, as victims? So up to now, um, four of the organizations that, that were attacked have filed uh, lawsuits. Um, uh, the political parties ERC, Esquerra Republicana Catalunya and CUP, and the two civil society organizations, ANC and Omnium. Uh, I think that June still hasn't uh, presented the, the lawsuits. Um, we all presented the lawsuits in the same court in Barcelona, court number 32, because this court was already investigating since 2020 the, um, the cases of two political leaders that were discovered, that it was discovered they had been spied on with Pegasus um, um, when the WhatsApp case went out. It was uh, uh, an inf uh, something that was, mm, well, mm, the, the one of the cases that of Pegasus worldwide that wa was discovered thanks to a failure in the WhatsApp system that WhatsApp discovered. So this, um, this court, in principle, there was a lawsuit filed uh, in, this, in, this, mm, in this court in Barcelona, and we thought that it would be easier if we all went there together. Well, what happened is that the, um, this court, the number 32, rejected the accumulation of the lawsuits, as if uh, they were different things. No? And, uh, and, uh, and also, the other thing that happened in court number 32 is that uh, for the time being, they have been. They had dismissed the 2020 case on the grounds of not having received a response from from NSCO in Israel. Well, then a different court 
accepted for each of, uh, of the organization, accepted, is investigating each lawsuit. And in July, only one had been accepted, but now, um, in July, last time I was here in Brussels, but now um, it's uh, four of them have al already been accepted by different courts in Barcelona. In our case, and this is also interesting, <laughs> Uh, we were so, so, so um, well, maybe it's a matter of probability, and as the judiciary in Spain is so much linked to the extreme right and far right and has uh, that many links with the Francoist period and regime, I, uh, it could happen. Uh, there's high, high, high probabilities of that happening, but still when it happens to you and with uh, this case that is so sensitive, Mm, it's, it, it makes you aware of, uh, of this uh, lack of independence of the judiciary in Spain. What happened is that the judge in that accepted our, our, our case in this court in Barcelona, in this tribunal in Barcelona, um, had a Facebook account, had had a Facebook account um, where she shared propaganda, political propaganda, anti-independence or, or of parties, anti-independence or other uh, organizations that are strongly anti-independence and demo things like that. So, and also he's linked to the military, but because he was the lieutenant auditing of the, of the military. And we are, we think, we suspect that it's uh, like or the civil ser services or the civil ward, which is a military body that has been doing the espionage. So it's his lack of independence was quite clear. So then what we did in August was to reject him, try to reject him as the judge. Um, and we were, expect, uh, we were still waiting this process because it's a little bit slow. But now we just received last week the, a communication from the, from the new judge because uh, a new judge has been appointed in this tribunal and not because we rejected him, just because uh, he was a substitute and now uh, the new judge has taken, or, or maybe yes, I don't know. But <laughs> the, the, the thing is that we finally have a judge that is not obviously linked to any political view, at least, at least, at least from the appearances. Uh, she's a woman and, and she doesn't l seems at least publicly compromised with any political course. Um, other things that have happened uh, are the inquiry committee in the European Parliament is doing his work. Uh, there are people in the audience that know it better than me, so I won't enter in, in the details. The only thing is it is worth me mentioning, it is up to now, a visit to Spain has not been planned, while a visit to Hungary and Poland, yes, they have been planned and are on, are on the agenda. And uh, finally, finally, the latest news, and it is not linked to Pegasus, uh, but it is um, linked to another spyware um, software, is that um, two secret documents uh, that were included in the investigation of several activists in a special tribunal, special court for terrorism in Madrid, the Audiencia Nacional, that were, these activists were detained in September 2019. And now finally, the, the lawyers of this case have been able to get the, the initial investigations that led to detain them in 2019. So these investigations go back to the November 2017, and in these um, investigations, we have we just discovered two days ago that around 40 activists, members of the political party called CUP, um, uh, pro-independence uh, radical left party, my organiza uh, our organization, the ANC, and the Council of the Republic, the, the organization that was founded by President Puigdemont in, in exile. Were, had been in, were investigated already in 2018 with another spyware uh, used by the C Spanish Civil War and the National Police. That is not Pegasus, uh, but it's another, another, another spyware. So that that those are the the latest news, and I'm just finishing because uh, 
it is better if we can move to questions quickly. Uh, well, my final reflection now is that it's a whole movement that is massively spied with prospective investigations uh, that in principle are prohibited by the law uh, and that the investigation is on the grounds of our ideology. Um, of course, uh, we consider that this is a case of a political espionage that violates fundamental rights, several fundamental rights. I can mention two of them. Of course, the right of pri to privacy, uh, which is covered by Article 8 of the Covenant of Human Rights of Strasbourg, uh, freedom as an of assembly, freedom of expression, uh, right to association are some of the mm, fundamental rights that we think are vulnerated, are violated with this massive um, political espionage, espionage that is taking place in a member state of the, of the EU. And that's it for now. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for all these details. You've already <laughs> anticipated some of my questions, but we will get back to you uh, in a moment also on recommendations. And um, next we would like to hear from David, um, who will tell us about also his experience and maybe with a focus on press freedom issues as well. Thank you very much. Well, first I would like to thank the ANC for holding this event on a day like uh, today. It is a pleasure for me to be here uh, with uh, Laura, Elisenda and Chloe. Now regarding uh, my uh, question, as a journalist, but not only as a journalist, as Elisenda already mentioned just a minute ago, uh, this has been an attack against a uh, democratic uh, political movement uh, that is uh, public and uh, very peaceful. So I'm also a member of that movement and therefore I speak on behalf of that 52% of uh, elected and representatives in the Catalan Parliament, but that includes journalists, uh, doctors, uh, lay citizens uh, from all walks of life. In my particular case, it was very specific. In 2020, um, just before the pandemic, I was alerted by a citizen lab, as it was the case uh, with many other people, that they had detected several uh, cyber attacks against my cell phone in order to infect it with Pegasus. Um, because of the uh, pro-independence exiles in Europe, I already knew that this existed. Uh, we had had uh, similar cases before. And then uh, from that moment on, there was a very slow, painstaking investigation to certify, at least uh, uh, to certify that there was this uh, massive uh, intrusion into our cell phones. Now, regarding the reasons, Alexander already pointed at them. They are already public they should be the ones telling us why they spied on us however it is true that uh, after those uh, two attacks that took place in 2018 and, and 2019 at least on my cell phone there were three elements uh, that we could uh, detect i was one of the spokesperson of the campaign against this uh, large uh, uh, judicial cause uh, the the legal case that was happening in 2019 there were hundreds of people um, from different ideologies that are, were part of that legal case, but I uh, had this responsibility of uh, being a, a spokesperson and I had a vital role in the whole campaign to defend um, um, the accused. Also, at the time, Um, there was an important media attention regarding the, the trial, also from Geneva, uh, every time that we spoke. And as Elisenda said, well, I also had a, a position in La Directa, uh, one of the many media in our country, but specializing in uh, um, investigative journalism and specifically repressive um, practices in uh, Spain. And this last uh, week, we heard about yet another kind of spyware that uh, was allegedly used through the Audiencia Nacional, which is quite a special court located in Madrid uh, on more than 50 cell phones that apparently were uh, um, bugged. Uh, and also they belonged, as uh, as Inda said, um, to members of the uh, CUP 
uh, board as well as uh, members of our parliament. So the Pegasus case is just one more uh, example, maybe the tip of the iceberg, and probably the one that had the highest um, international political impact. Unfortunately, as we know, Pegasus has been present in Saudi Arabia, uh, Poland, uh, Hungary, uh, Mexico, and well, it has been quite uh, dramatically used elsewhere. But we, as the victims, have never been officially notified by any Spanish institution and regarding the facts that uh, were published because of this uh, journalistic investigation. I think that Elizinda already uh, mentioned uh, quite a, a dual nature of what was happening because uh, way before we already explained that this was happening, uh, beginning with uh, the president of the Catalan government and as she said, uh, WhatsApp as a company explained that they had had a, a glitch in their system, and that was the beginning for that investigation. We obviously lodged uh, complaints. Uh, we as a CUP, the, our uh, left-wing political party, has uh, brought that to the public attention, and we are still pending a legal uh, answer whether uh, that complaint uh, was admitted or not. We were just notified that we have been admitted and now we need to uh, provide our, our cell phones uh, to the prosecutor's office so that they can properly examine this. But this is such a slow process as compared to how the prosecutor's office uh, decided to speed the, their process up, the whole proceeding, and how you know, he, they um, questioned uh, uh, many other people, such as Spanish uh, politicians from the Spanish government who had also been spied on, and that happened pretty quickly. So it has an impact on me from three uh, different points of view, as a political uh, journalist, as a political representative, and as a person. Obviously, we are a group, 65 people, at least to the best of our knowledge, at least 65 people, but these attacks have happened, have been waged against a democratic uh, movement, and therefore against the ideas. So how could I express this? Probably not in uh, our own words. I can share an anecdote with you. Uh, the number two uh, police uh, officer of the National uh, Guard in December um, uh, Commissioner Pino, who has been uh, charged for falsifying evidence as part of the Catalan Gate case, acknowledged that they had done things uh, for the benefit of Spain, and I'm quoting him, uh, that probably would send uh, your spine chilling uh, if you heard exactly what we had done. Well, this was uh, a, a sentence that... Uh, you know, they counter uh, question him, what do you mean uh, things, uh, everything? And he said, yes, everything for the homeland, which is the official slogan of um, the, the police uh, uh, forces in Spain, because he said, yes, anything, whatever was needed. So he said, yes, uh, everything that was needed was done. And that includes, well, violating the privacy of our fellow members of the assembly, three uh, presidents of our country, um, MPs, Euro MPs, so social activists, uh, journalists, uh, family members, uh, uh, also members of Omnium uh, Cultural, the, the whole board of directors of Omnium, and selectively the, the person who was in charge of international uh, policies, as well as uh, institutional relations within the country, as well as uh, Jordi Couchard's uh, partner. So the political effects, as well as well, the intimate repercussions were indeed uh, blatantly offensive and devastating. Uh, well, I cannot... Uh, I knew that this could happen to me, but I, uh, I won't forget uh, that I have also exposed my friends. I have revealed everything in their lives, health issues, uh, job-related conversations, uh, personal issues. So that's something that uh, it'll be hard for me to to process, I've exposed them to this kind of peril. And I believe that there's a lot of food for thought here. 
we still have a, a secret information, state secrecy uh, law that comes uh, dates back uh, from uh, Franco from the Franco time, which allows the government to to carry out this uh, state uh, um, terrorism with uh, repressive ends. Uh, I believe that you know we are living in this Snowden and Assange time. We are not naive. Uh, we know that these kind of things uh, happen. There was a, a report back in '91 uh, to the civil uh, population of the kind of technologies that were being uh, wielded uh, to exert this political control. And I believe that, well, the, the, the whole report of uh, Citizen Lab, uh, the Spanish government, the first time they heard about them, they, they tried to, well, to say that they were not to be trusted, uh, that nobody knew who they were. And then when they found out that their own officials were being spied on, they did recognize this and they said, well, there, there was an official mandate of the um, secret services in Spain. And this is how stories began. First, people deny things and, and towards the end of the process, they have to uh, own things up. I believe that we need to be very active at the international scale, uh, going to institutions, also from a legal point of view, because we are following the whole Spanish proceeding to the very end so that we can appeal up to uh, higher uh, courts and institutions. And finally, through the social uh, sphere, by socializing the need to implement cyber security and, and safety measures for any citizen who wants to um, well, be able to exert his or her freedom and, and their rights and duties without being spied on. We cannot isolate this Pegasus case uh, in the past five years. This this will be the last thing I say. Uh, in 2015, for the government to be able to, to carry out this kind of spionage uh, on our population, they, they implemented two kind of operations. One was a legal operation. Uh, uh, the prosecutor, uh, Dragoza, who was in charge of this whole uh, legal case against them um, pro-independence uh, ever since 2017, they set up a specific a unit uh, to defend constitutional principles, which is part of the uh, Spanish uh, secret services as well. And something else that we found out this very year, uh, which in a way is quite a sample of uh, political perversion. They had to recognize that everything that they had been doing could only be uh, done if they understand a pro-independence uh, movement in Catalonia as part of the uh, national strategy against terrorism. So in this case, to be able to spy on them, to plant uh, uh, cover uh, police uh, agents, uh, the only legal framework they have uh, in their hands is to call a service and to include that as part of the strategy. It's the only possibility, the only law that allows for this kind of uh, uh, interception uh, and espionage. And just to give you, to, to finish on with a positive note, uh, because obviously a secret of state uh, that is known is no longer a secret. This was done thanks to the work of uh, our uh, our fellow citizens. It is not a Catalan problem, a Spanish problem, not even a European problem, even though Europe has a problem when it diverts its gaze somewhere else. Uh, this is a global issue, but I, I, I would try to go back to ancient times, to Greek mythology. Uh, the uh, only one who, who could take Take back Pegasus, this unbridled uh, horse uh, that uh, was uh, ridden by Bellerophon, who had this uh, uh, rampant and boundless ambition. The horse was taken back by a gadfly, a small insect. Uh, it was the only one who managed to take it down. And in this case, it was a Catalan pro-independence movement, the one that uh, played the role of this gadfly. And this... Mm, this reminds me of Martin Luther King, as Lysander knows, uh, because of his uh, civil, peaceful disobedience uh, with nonviolence. He said that he was a gadfly as well. We all need to be these small gadflies that manage to take down the horse. That's why we're here with Laura and, um, and Chloe and Lysander. So I would like to remind you that I, uh, small gadflies are sometimes able uh, to dismantle these uh, state uh, strategies and who try to apply this kind of feudal control on our lives. That's it. Thank you. And thank you for ending on a positive note because this is uh, often a topic that can get very frustrating because of so many negative news that we are hearing. I would also like to pick up on uh, the national uh, security interest uh, curtain or carpets that you were referring to that is also picked up by 
many other states such as uh, Greece. And um, this leads me to the next point. Um, this is unfortunately not um, an isolated incident or collective uh, of incidents. This is happening all over the world, uh, as uh, David also said. Chloe, could you give us more of a, a context uh, on the EU uh, side and also on how this affects digital rights? Sure, thank you so much. Um, so. Um, EDRI is a network of organizations who we represent NGOs that are working at national level. But today in the debate, I'm going to focus on the role of the EU uh, in this whole case. Uh, I'm not going to go in each detail, like each member state, what happened, where are the cases, uh, where the cases are at at the moment, and so on. I, I just really want to uh, explain to you our views as civil society, trying to coordinate action at the EU level, how we see. Um, the reaction of the European Union. Um, and uh, the question was like, how do you like see, for example, the efforts and initiative by the European Parliament setting up an inquiry committee? Is it good? Is it bad? I had, I, I just did this small like kind of mental exercise to list pros and cons, and I would like to share it with them, uh, with you, and we can discuss about this. Um, on, on the positive aspect, I think it really much keep the ball rolling. Um, an issue of surveillance, as da David said, it's, it's not new. We know it's going on for a long time. Um, but n unfortunately, we keep on uh, having the topic uh, hidden under the carpet very much. Like a civil society, it's very hard to keep the topic high on the debate and in the press. Um, and those kind of scandals like remind us that this is here and it, it can target anyone for any reason and especially bad reasons. Um, so it it's sh is not banal and it should not become banal that this sort of mass, very intrusive surveillance that is highly uh, intrusive and um, interfering with the right to privacy um, and data protection, but also freedom of expression as it is on the set, um, how it should not become the subject of social acceptance Everybody starts like believing this is very banal. There is a normalization. Everybody internalizes uh, the state norms that surveillance is okay, and and that in in the sense that we see the European Parliament taking a stance, showing that it is alarmed, that it is not accepting this level of intrusive surveillance. It's questioning it. Uh, it's showing concerns. Is a very good signal, especially as a European Parliament chamber at the only kind of in EU institution that I need to remind you that this is a direct representative of citizens. Uh, very good. Uh, compared to commissioners, so t especially two commissioners that are assumed that have been targeted by the spyware. Um, so Commissioner for Justice um, Didier Reinders from Belgium and uh, Margaret Vostaga, uh, Denmark, uh, on uh, competition. Uh, and both said, as a reaction to the first um, wave of Pegasus scandal, and the fact that they might have been targeted, or their phones have, might have been targeted, they said, it's not an EU competence, do not worry about us, as it was a normal thing to be spied on as someone in a high-ranking uh, position at EU level. Um, that, shows very, that sends very wrong signal to the population. It's okay to be spied on. It's okay to have your device hacked. Um, what the Vestager said, for example, she said, oh, if they hacked my device, they would have been very disappointed. I have nothing to hide. This is, my life is very boring. This is grave as a statement for an EU official. It really is not showing, or uh, not leading by example. Like you, each and every one of us have things that we want to keep private and this is normal. Your health status, uh, your sexual orientation, how you feel, your, like your emotional status as well. This can be weaponized against you, and for very bad reason if it falls, if this information falls in the wrong hands. So already this, as like taking the matter as really important and not diminishing it, very important, very good. It also shines lights on practices that benefit from a culture historically of secrecy. Intelligent services are really acting in this culture, not sharing much information. It's even hard uh, for uh, policymakers when they try to build and frame a legislation um, to know to put the cursor on transparency, how transparent we want them to be, knowing the fact that their very nature is to keep their activities secret, to be effective. 
where there's like effective versus transparency uh, a thing. So we want to actually, I think it's a good thing that we push for a more open society and that we try to keep those kind of remissant um, practices, like really this past practices of nothing is transparent, nothing should be de debated uh, publicly when it comes to intelligence services, when it comes to national security, they should be put actually to the front and debated publicly. So it's very good. And when you look at the reaction of each member state, when the PEGA committee of the European Parliament starts saying, we're going to organize a mission in your on your territory, they start being like, no, please don't come. Uh, like there is nothing you, you there there is nothing to see at us. Uh, don't worry. It shows already that it's a good sign that we actually go and put our nose in their in their affairs. Um, the second good thing I, I think about the the, the, the initiative at, by the European Parliament is that it acknowledged that uh, spyware and all those kind of scandal waves are a, of European relevance. It is a European matter, and David said it's a global matter. I, th I won't go there because I don't master so much this, and I think he's right. But for first and foremost, we can already ar arrange uh, among ourselves, among European countries, um, some common understanding of what is acceptable and what is not acceptable in our societies, um, in terms of civilians, in terms of respect to uh, fundamental rights. Um, and it's super important to look at the similarities of the of different cases and uh, national legal frameworks as well. Who, which member state requires a judicial authorization for such hacking practices? Which don't? If they do, how does it work? Is the judge really involved before the practice, before the hack happens or after? How does it work in practice? So all those questions need to be really answered and analyzed. Um, then um, the Court of Justice already m uh, said in multiple cases on, um, on security um, related legislation that even though member states are, um, as um, Laura said, are kind of hiding behind the veil of national security, it's like, oh, it's not an EU competence. Don't look, don't come and look in my affairs. The Court of Justice already stated in its jurisprudence that we have EU common rules that protects people's private communications. We have common rules on data protection and we have a charter of fundamental rights and the member state needs to abide by this because they signed it. And when they do things wrong, it's a matter of EU competence as well. At least this is uh, what we are advocating for. And then <coughs> also thinking that it's purely a national matter that prevents us also from thinking how governments are actually sharing data among each other. And that is an increasing practices over time that intelligent services are sharing data much more among others. Um, and the problem is that when we try to look um, and do some sort of oversight over what's going on, if we limit ourselves to just at purely national level, we won't be able to see how the information is actually flowing from one territory to another. And so you only apply the rules to one hand of the string, but not on the other. That's also why it's super important to look at it from European perspective. That was the positive aspect. I have a long list of negative aspects. I'm gonna try to go a bit faster. <laughs> <laughs> um, first, political games that was mentioned already. This committee has been captured by political games. Um, if uh, the, c the member state that is uh, at the heart of a new scandal is being hit, uh, is being um, is is coming on in the in the uh, in the center of the light. Um, the MEP sitting in the committee that belongs to this member state and especially the ruling uh, party starts freaking out and say, no, 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 we don't want a mission. Uh, we don't want to be. Please look at this. So every time there is a, a new scandal in Spain, all the Polish MEPs are raising their hands, saying like, look at Spain, what they're doing, and vice versa. So that's one. Then there is the scandal cycle, which uh, David alluded a little bit to. Um, it's problematic that every time I feel like we're raising from a, like we're um, victim of a general amnesia. Um, there were stuff already happening at EU level after the Snowden revelation in 2013. Um, the European Parliament took two resolutions on electronic mass surveillance of citizens, one in 2014 and one in 2015. 
there were 135 recommendations in those reports. Where is the implementation? Who has been looking at which recommendations were implemented by member state or the European Commission, Who, which not? And how do we do, how do we implement them? How do we put them in practice? And there were really interesting stuff from, from, from the time, like the, the parliament asked member state to prohibit blanket mass surveillance and bulk processing of personal data. They said protect journalist sources and protect the press. Uh, they say promote um, encryption of communication. Do they do that? I don't know. Um, do they promote the use of open source software? It's all a series of, of, of recommendations that we don't know we, we don't know how to track the actual implementation and that would be very interesting uh, to do actually. And it proves problematic but because for example in one of the, and that comes to your point Laura about national security, one of the recommendations of the parliament at the time said stress that a common definition of national security is needed for the EU and its member states to ensure legal certainty. Note that the lack of a clear definition allows for arbitrariness and abuses of fundamental right and the rule of law by executive and intelligence communities in the EU. So there was already a problem, this national security loophole under behind which member states were hiding. And now what, what do we have? The Commission, the European Commission just proposed a month ago uh, a new legislation to protect media, the European Media Freedom Act. And in one of the uh, pro uh, provision, it, it says that they want to member state shall respect effective editorial freedom of media service provider. And then later they say member states shall not deploy spyware in any device or machine used by media service provider. Interesting, very good. Their family members, their employees, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But unless it is justified on a case-by-case -case basis on grounds of national security. Et voila. And we still don't have a definition. So that proves that we are not learning from the mistakes of the past and we don't actually, there, there isn't a learning curve. We're still, we are still in 2022 reinventing the wheel, still not knowing what is national security, what are the limits of member states. Um, I will finish by saying that um, the, the committee will issue a report in early 2023, it is expected. It's not gonna be binding like in 2014, like in 2015, it's just gonna be a set of recommendation. The power to initiate actual legislation, binding legislation rests with the European Commission. Unless you convince this body to do something, nothing will, will happen at European Union level at least. Um, and then I want to just finish on a wider set, like um, when we have those kind of reaction, uh, we tend to look at the matter in silo, um, like, oh, there is a spyware, let's focus on spyware, how to regulate spyware. But we tend to forget that this is happening in a wider set of how actually the European Union on the other side is actually expanding uh, surveillance capacities of a lot of, of law enforcement agency across Europe. Not just their own agencies, like the Europe Europol, the law enforcement agency of the European Union. Um, that agency just benefited from a huge increase of its power for data collection, for data processing, um, receiving data from third countries, for example, receiving data from uh, private companies if they want, uh, using algorithm to process this data and make uh, intelligent threat analysis, for example. Um, this um, agency will benefit from a lot of new powers and at the same time less oversight. So on the one hand, we are very shocked by what is happening at member state level, but on the other side, we don't see how much the European Union is being used to produce new legislation that will increase surveillance capacities um, of law enforcement communities in general. And it's just one example, but I can also cite how many laws at national level were passed in the last past five years for allowing hacking uh, by law enforcement uh, agencies and authorities in the Netherlands, in France, in Germany, in Poland, in Sweden, all of them pass new laws that allows more easily to hack devices 
by law enforcement authorities, not just by intelligence services. So this is also a, a matter of looking at the broader picture and how um, we cannot remain focused on this one specific issue, but also look at how um, the legislation is not going in the wrong, in the right direction, unfortunately. Thank you so much, uh, Chloe. I would like to add one thing. I don't know if uh, you already know about this, but um, the committee decided not to go uh, to Spain. Of course, uh, a lot of journalists were also asking the questions, why why not Spain? And um, there was a lot of back and forth. Uh, the committee was uh, once not uh, very clear whether they will actually go to Spain because, th of course, there was a backlash because this is the, the biggest scandal. Um, and then uh, a committee member uh, told me that the reason was that um, we're going to Poland and Hungary because there's also a lot of rule of law issues there. So these are the problem child of, of Europe and uh, children. Um, and that's why we're not going uh, to Spain uh, because everything is fine basically in Spain. That was the explanation by uh, the committee member. Um, I feel like we already uh, have covered a lot of uh, consequences, etc. But maybe we can now move on to recommendations. Uh, maybe first from Elisenda and David for, from a personal uh, perspective also because of how you were treated as victims or not <laughs> treated. Um, and then also more from a, a structural um, point for legislation. If Elisenda could start. Well, uh, I think that from a legal point of view, the the path that we have is very long. It ends up in the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg, but in in a few years, no, it's a very slow path because first we have to exhaust all the internal internal possibilities that we have in the in the law in uh, according to the law in Spain. And um, what worries a little bit, and I think uh, it's something that we we have to be able to transcend that, is like is the shilling effect. Uh, the fact that um, it is good that these cases are known because now we can take some action. We already in the movement we already knew that we were spied. We didn't have any proof, but we knew it. F um, but um, but it is a little bit worrying that um, the effect of if the so it is good that it is known now and that we can do something we can denounce it in inter in the international arena we can take some legal actions etc uh, but the bad the bad thing is uh, this chilling effect uh, is this going to affect other people that will decide I'm not going to be a member of this organization because then it's like it, uh, I might be spied, or um, no. So it's a reduction in the in the capacity of activism uh, and democratic compromise and engagement in causes, in political causes, um, because of that. So we have to think how to how to prevent to prevent that. And I don't think the the right thing is to say, as uh, this commissioner said. Uh, I have nothing to hide, etc. No, uh, we have to say it, it is, it is, it is, it is something that is not mm, right to do, and it's vulnerating rights. And uh, but at the same time, say, hey, we've been spied on, and that doesn't affect us in our engagement, and we will keep keep being engaged. No, so I think for the movement. Uh, it is important that we also give this positive message of um, empowerment and uh, persistence in, in our ideas and in our activity. I think also to get back to the statement of the commissioner that oh, I have nothing to hide. This is what I've heard already from so many people who are like, ah, anybody, uh, it, it doesn't matter if I'm spied upon, I have n no secrets, but it's not only about you, it's also the people in your contact list, uh, as like family members, this is a network and they can access mm -hmm. all kinds of information that you don't even know you have access to through your phone. David, would you also um, like to uh, add on um, recommendations from your perspective? Yes, um, but I think I agree with uh, what Elisenda was just mentioning. 
obviously, one would expect uh, that all democratic parliaments uh, would do uh, the international affair thing to do to ensure that these things will never happen again, that it will be properly investigated, but this is not happening. And, and to request this from the Spanish government now um, it is very mm, difficult. There's one case of illegal espionage um, back from the 90s uh, for the Basque for independence uh, movement, uh, mass illegal uh, espionage through um, video cameras on the uh, facilities, the headquarters of a political uh, party. Um, they had been wiretapped for years and uh, there were, they passed judgment uh, in the end. So there was one legal case that came to an end. Uh, if we have this long-standing memory, we will remember this. I think that this experience that we have all collectively uh, gone through, I think it's like a handbook. First, the narrative, when the first report uh, was published, and these things are not happening, everything you're saying is not true, I, we don't even know who these Canadian people are. Then uh, we went through a second stage, okay, let's try to give it some context, there might be something in there. And then thirdly, um, a justification openly in the parliament, the minister of uh, defense, Margarita Robles herself, as well as the minister of uh, justice, uh, Kanda Marlaska, who has several um, uh, judgments from the uh, European Human Rights Court against him, saying, well, this was part of the fight against terrorism. So, in a way, we're we're going the Turkish way um, by uh, illegalizing and criminalizing this whole uh, peaceful movement. I believe that, uh, as it was being said, it is important not to feel defeated and to continue moving on. Um, our legal case is just one of many. Um, as Elisenda was saying at the very beginning, uh, this, uh, these legal cases ha have now been scattered through different courts of justice. And, uh, well, thinking that the, in this case, the defendant will investigate itself, meaning the government, uh, well, we don't pin many hopes on that particular possibility. Uh, it might be possible if we resort to a peripheral uh, level of justice uh, outside of the uh, Spanish uh, uh, courts, uh, however, if this is being tried by the Audiencia Nacional or other Spanish courts, uh, we don't have many hopes. Um, when we were speaking about the law of uh, official secrets, as I was saying, this was inherited by the Franco time from 1968 from by the dictatorship saying, well, these, all of this information that we are collecting is a secret of state. Well, this is uh, hopefully being reformed, but uh, not yet. Um, uh, depending on the legal case, we're talking about four to 50 years of possible imprisonment. And there has been an, an, an important consequence of this political scandal, uh, which, is, well, it's a scandal because the director of the National Center for Intelligence had to resign at the time um, just to, to find a, a, a scapegoat in a way because it was a crisis and somebody had to pay for that. And as it has been said, well, uh, there are also the uh, NSO um, group, the the one that has sold this software. Uh, well, they have been subjected to this kind of uh, indictments. Uh, however, um, a great deal of the information we know is because it has been published by the media. Because in a way, all of these operations are happening uh, uh, outside the Spanish uh, soil, it has been relocated to the headquarters of NSO, which hinders uh, the legal proceedings uh, once more. And it favors this kind of uh, oppression against the pro-independence movement. Uh, just like we had to wait until the Italian legal system or the German or the Belgian legal system would say whether they would uh, return President Puigdemont to Spain or not. Uh, so on the one side, uh, we don't ha have many hopes, but we are also hopeful in the collective action, civil, social, international action, uh, as well as uh, legal possibilities outside of the country. I believe that, uh, well, we will have to resort to other courts of justice. And I think that Chloe already hit the nail on the head in, the, in Spain. Uh, this is a democratic anomaly 
I mean, we live in a country where we have a president that has been exiled elsewhere in Europe for five years now uh, because of this movement. So the question is right. Uh, for uh, national defense, for national interest, what can be done? What is illegal to, to do? Obviously, people are talking about uh, drug trafficking, fighting against uh, the mafia, etc. Well, these tools are there and they are provided by the law. But if you're using them for other kind of crimes and you include this kind of political dissidence or opposition, well, this is the beginning of a dystopia, unfortunately. And um, Catalan pro-independence has already experienced this. Thank you so much. Uh, Chloe, you already said there have been already so many recommendations put in place, but maybe you could focus on the ones that you consider the main ones that we really need to tackle, that really need to be implemented now, and maybe also assess how likely it is that this <laughs> will take place. The last part of your question is maybe the most uh, difficult <laughs> to answer. Uh, I'm going to start with what our wish list uh, as civil society. Maybe it's easier this way. Um, we first we want to um, ban outright, prohibit the use of certain type of hacking techniques. I would call them this way. So again, think of it like Pegasus is one type of spyware that can be used to hack a device, to hack a software, to gain access to data that is uh, protected by um, encryption, for example, uh, or any type of other security systems. Um, there are others. Uh, first and foremost, there is one that is not you again. It dates from the 90s and it's called backdoors. It's basically uh, obliging by law um, service provider to actually create a vulnerability in their systems so law enforcement can access data uh, hold in this, held in the system. Uh, when, whenever they want. Um, and that means usually weakening uh, their own products, their own s security systems, um, by creating those still backdoors, as they call them, uh, to be exploited uh, in these narrow circumstances, uh, circumstances, as they say it. For us, it's, it's completely unacceptable in a democratic society that we have such practices. Um, they are so dangerous for fundamental rights, and they are very dangerous also for the security of, I of our IT systems. So definitely backdoors, we don't want that. Um, if I if I have an, an example, currently uh, the European Commission has been proposing uh, legislation um, to detect um, um, child sexual abuse material in private communications. Um, in the text, it would require service providers such as Signal, WhatsApp, um, Telegram, name it, name the, 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 the next ones, to actually introduce a backdoor to the system so they can scan the entire communication between you and your friend, you and your grandma, etc., to look for potential sharing of those images. Um, and this is very problematic as it introduces systematic vulnerabilities at a really sy system level, and it puts everybody in danger. Um, and it's also very problematic that your entire private communication is scanned on the basis that eventually you would be a suspect, but it's very prospective, as uh, Elisanda mentioned uh, before. Um, so that is a practice we would like to see prohibited and never used ever by any government. Another one is obviously the use of uh, coercion uh, for self-incrimination. Um, this is also very specific, but um, this is something, I think it's linked to social activism, and I think it's important to say it now because we're talking about social, uh, civil society, we are talking about um, uh, movements, social movements, uh, journalists, etc. Um, this is a practice we see more and more used by police forces during demonstrations or... Um, any kind of other uh, protests, uh, taking the phone of the person and then intimidating them so they can release their code, their PIN code to access the device and then look for, for data. And usually it's threat of criminal offense, of being put in jail, uh, brought to custody, uh, other type of coercion that we know of. This is also a practice we would like to see ban at European Union level. Um, and then like looking at actual hacking and, and in the sense of when I say hacking is really a definition of getting access 
unauthorized access to a device or a system or software. Um, we would need to put into legislation a very, very narrow uh, uh, a window of possibility to do that. But in the meantime, given our observation on the ground and from what we see in national legislation, no, none of the member states could achieve um, our set of standards. Uh, and in that case, we, we say like we should just ban the whole practice of uh, state hacking. Like it shouldn't be possible. Um, we, we establish a set of standards, as I mentioned, it's 11 standards, 11 conditions for hacking by state actors. And they're very strict, they're cumulative. If one doesn't work, it's, it's, it doesn't work, we're against. Um, it's very simple and yet so fundamental. Um, it's stuff like um, meeting the quality of law requirement, which means um, please put in law what you can do and what you cannot do. It sounds so basic and yet there was a study in 2017 by the European Parliament that did a comparative study between the Netherlands, France, Germany, etc. that showed that most of the um, many s uh, law enforcement authorities were doing hacking and using tools, spyware, etc. in gray area um, uh, of the law. They were using like really gray areas of the law and not really abiding by any rules. Uh, so that was done, There's just, it was being done. As David said, anything from for the for the homeland, right? Um, so this is already problematic. Then there is the necessity and proportionality requirement. Is that okay that if you are a suspect, um, like let let's assume you're a real suspect of a of a crime, is it uh, is it okay that the investigative authorities have access to your entire device, all your photos, all your communications? everything on your device, like all your apps revealing very intimate information about it. Do they really need this for this ca for their case? Probably not. Um, and this is also what the same conclusion uh, we share with the European Data Protection Supervisors, uh, which who said that basically Pegasus should be banned because it really threatened the essence of the right to privacy. Uh, because it's so intrusive. It's everything in your device is so intrusive. Um, and therefore those type of, of, of tools should be prohibited. Um, so it should be very narrow, circums uh, circumscribed, restricted access to the specific data that law enforcement need for the case. And then we, like there are 11, I'm not gonna go through all of them because it takes a while, um, but they will be on our website on the 21st of October, which is the Global Day of Encryption. Uh, I just want to finish by saying that uh, maybe we didn't mention it uh, enough, but um, the reason why it's possible to have this uh, political persecution of activists um, is also because there are vulnerabilities in systems in the first place. So there is a role for private actors to play here and one of our recommendations is to oblige government if they find a vulnerability in a system that they want to exploit, that they have to report it to the private vendor and to the, pl the software developers so they can patch it, they can fix it. Otherwise, you just leave open so many vulnerabilities that will be used first by your government that you don't necessarily trust when you're an independent, pro-independence uh, regionalist movement. <laughs> Second, it can be used by malicious actors all across the world, not just in your own country. Um, so this is very important also for the security of everybody that those vulnerability doesn't, don't remain uh, to be sold to anyone on the shady opaque market, uh, mainly by companies uh, based in Israel. Great, thank you so much. Uh, maybe uh, one uh, comment. Uh I don't know if you've heard about uh, the book, This is How They Tell Me the World Ends. This would uh, be a book recommendation for you to follow up with uh, everything Chloe just said. And also the connection to the CSAM file, the child sexual, sexual abuse material legislation. I find that interesting because on the one hand we're talking about um, how we can improve the situation and then on, on, on the side in parallel we're actually uh, in the making of legislation that would open up 
for even more surveillance. Um, and we have reasons of national security, terrorism, and now it's also child abuse that is, uh, of course, we all know a huge problem and it is deteriorating, but uh, we shouldn't um, always uh, compare child abuse with privacy because these are just completely different things. Um, so I would like to ask you if you have uh, any questions uh, um, and maybe also tell us who you want to ask the question. Um, <clears throat> maybe I, I would like to ask the question to um, Alizenda. Um, Recently, I, I am the deputy representative of the Catalan government here at, uh, to the EU. Last week, the Catalan government uh, is, um, made public the Declaration of Geneva, which is a declaration done with uh, NGO Access Now, with the headquarters in New York, that is asking for a moratorium in the sale and use of, of spyware until appropriate legislation is developed. And um, um, Elisenda talked about the chilling effect. The chilling effect is, is uh, I, I myself, I'm a Catalan pro-independence uh, activist, and it, it, it is all-encompassing. Your, your bank accounts are not safe. You will be, you may end up in jail. You will be spied upon. You will, you will um, uh, be subjected to fake news uh, that you have accounts in, in, in Switzerland or what, whatever or that you are working with the Russians when you are actually translating a, a Russian novel. So it's all encompassing and it's very serious. When you, when you hear the, the reasons that Spain is giving and they think it's, uh, it flies, that um, people are terrorists, uh, so it, it sounds like China. Uh, they were preparing subversive acts, they had materials at home that could maybe uh, be uh, in a bomb one day. So uh, Spain is, be, it is sounding very much like China. If it, and if the reaction in Europe is, oh, it's national security, we cannot do anything, or we don't have a competence, all oh, this is uh, up to the states, then we are lost because there are no limits. If you, if you have an ideology that the state doesn't like, they, they make you immediately a suspect for terrorism or corruption or whatnot, whatever law for they, they feel like. And, and uh, I feel as a European completely defenseless. So uh, with the recent case of these dozens of people, uh, what are the judicial um, uh, measures that you are taking? And maybe David also. Okay. Mm, you are. Um, um, yeah, first of all, sorry, I, I forgot to mention this Geneva Declaration with Access Now. I think it's a good thing that was organized by the um, Catalan Ministry of um, International Affairs and the delegation in Switzerland. Um, uh, the question you are asking for the legal action is the newest case, no? This mm, last thing that was... Uh, revealed by la directa well i just talked to to our lawyer yesterday <laughs> because that's very new um, we still uh, in our case a and c we still don't have access to this information we only s know what has been published by by efe and la directa and to, to media so first we need to have access to this information and what he said is that in this case uh, we cannot go against the police as we did in the lawsuits for Pegasus, but we should go against the judge that authorized that. At least, first of all, ask him why did why you authorized? Mm, because there wa it was not only mm, a spyware; it was also following us and taking pictures of us in front of the. Of the of the headquarters of the of the, uh, the our association, so well he said he needs to well he has to study it and how we can tackle this issue uh, this issue now, um, but yeah we will will we'll try to I mean, I think what we have to fight everything, we cannot let things pass, at the same time not creating panic. I mean, no, just saying, okay, we already knew that that was happening, but, but take action, fight, fight things and not uh, allowing them, uh, treat, not treat them as normal. Because another reflection I wanted to, to, to make uh, um, regarding your comments is this, um, 
if if the, we you al we allow this to happen in liberal democracies, what are is going to be the capacity of liberal democracies to lecture authoritarian and semi-authoritarian regimes? What is going to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is going to say to any body, any international body or European body? You don't have to tell us anything. Uh, look at what you do in Sp in Spain. So, so I think it's important to to fight up all the battles, mm, both in international bodies, the UN. Uh, we already did some action collectively in the UN, like writing to the rapporteurs. Uh, so, we are expecting s to see something in the UN as well. So, fight all the use all our tools to to fight these and 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 convert it in a, create a boomerang effect that goes that turns the repression against the the perpetrators of the repression do we have more questions hi uh, well thank you very interesting um yes i think we need to to kind of move into different levels. But in a way, I'm quite pessimistic because the states will continue spying. But what can we do from the uh, social movements, from, from NGOs, to protect ourselves? Of course, we can always have the go to a lawyer, try to make a case in court. But OK, that's something that we can do it. It takes time and might solve something or nothing because maybe the judge will say it was fine, it was legal, and you just have to cope with it. But on our, on our day to day, what can we do? I mean, do we need to uh, not use mobile phones? Do, do we need to, uh, I, I don't know, because we need to keep going, we need to keep doing what we are doing, and, and we need some kind of guidelines, like you're gonna be spied, it's only a matter of time, but in the meantime, here are some things that you that you could do. Well, I think that um, what we can do is like anything that could be misinterpreted um, by a sp in our case, if we are Catalans, anything that uh, a Spanish policeman can misinterpret, don't don't uh, write it in the phone, or don't talk to. Uh, talk talk uh, in the f uh, don't ma don't have it in a in a conversation even things not even even things that are cannot be misinterpreted from a legal point of view but things that are very sensitive politically like regard in what concerns political strategy for instance uh, try to avoid discussing them in on the phone or 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 messaging them just do it in the old ways, like uh, physically in meetings. So we have to go back a little bit to old, old, uh, old style of doing politics. That's uh, an advice for for, for for dealing with this uh, in a daily in a daily basis. They can still. There's something I didn't set. But Chloe made me think about it when she says, at least prohibit the uh, spy wars that are so intrusive. I think this is important because what I suspect they do with the information they have been gathering with uh, of us, because they haven't done anything legally because we haven't committed any crime, so they couldn't do anything. But I'm, I'm quite convinced that they have been um, creating psychological profiles of us to use our weaknesses in the political arena when they when they need to so so um, so this is important because this spyware is so intrusive that it allows them to do that while other types of spywares mm, other kinds of techniques mm, don't allow uh, are not so intrusive that to allow them to do that um yeah, I can, I can only re like. Uh, I wouldn't say throw away your phone. Uh, this is not our line of of advocacy towards like non people don't throw away your phone. Obviously, 
it's more like be aware of how it can be weaponized against you and what you agree to share online, what do you agree to insert in it. So indeed, it m may need that you may resort to more traditional old fashion of or arranging your life like a paper calendar or <laughs> something like this. Uh, it's up to you how you, you comfort your... But if you are really the target of state repression, um, they will manage to wiretap you. They will manage to put bugs in your cars. They would manage to put bugs in your house. So, um, and this can be allowed uh, by a court order. Um, the laws are there for this. So for sure, it's more a question of awareness and what you decide to uh, share and put out uh, to the world as private information. Um, what is interesting, like if I think of like the benefits from a, a, a structural point of view rather than individual level, it sucks that you're being <laughs> surveilled illegally or uh, illegitimately. Um, but if you think about it, if you make it hard for them to get information, that means they have they need to spend more budget. Uh, they need to m spend more resources, costs. It costs a lot to pay people to follow you in the street, to put bugs in your house, to put bugs in your car, um, to actually try to get hold of your device so they can implant something on it. That requires a lot of resources. And that is an accountability measure that we tend to underestimate. Is The more you rise the cost of surveillance, the more the state is going to have to think double, like twice, do I really have enough budget to do this? And it narrows down the number of cases and they're not able as much to scale up in terms of surveillance measure. So that's inter interesting. David, would you like to add something? Yes, uh, very briefly. Trying to pick up on the different questions that uh, have been asked. Uh, regarding the declaration of uh, Geneva by Carla Minister uh, Victoria Alzina, I believe that it's a great uh, proposal to apply uh, a moratorium on the use of these technologies, especially when they haven't been regulated. It's like a bottomless pit that can be used uh, to to combat uh, global operations and terrorist operations that need to be fought against, but also to spy on your uh, political uh, rivals. In the case of Spain, as Elisenda pointed out, the problem is that traceability and the public uh, accounting of these practices is pretty much non-existent. In regarding the 65 people who had been spied on members of the Catalan uh, pro-independence movement, to think that this is the result of just one judge is impossible, you know. Uh, a judge may uh, sign a document and authorize this, but obviously they do not uh, monitor or follow up on what's being done. And the case that... Uh, was known this very week, uh, uh, the report by La Directa, so 50 uh, well-known people who have this um, uh, public uh, political uh, task, uh, even the cover of the report, which is more than 50 pages uh, long, it says terrorism. That's the word that is used. And without this possible uh, terrorism charge, they cannot even apply that law. And this is this bottom bottomless pit that they resort to whenever it's convenient for them. And I can tell you right now that there's no single act of terrorism in the Catalan pro-independence movement. The opposite is true. This movement has been stubbornly peaceful and non-violent. And I believe that we speak about regulation, but there's a complete lack of control. It's a uh, winner takes it all. They can do whatever they please with this kind of law. And we don't know exactly if there's a limit to this kind of law. Um, the, the Spanish um, secret services do as they please. There used to be a repressive commander uh, back in the 90s that said a, a sentence that is even rem remembered today. I am back in the 90s with uh, 27 uh, fa uh, fatal uh, casualties. He said, well, there are things that are done but not talked about, and if they're talked about, you deny them. And I'm, I'm saying this today, now that you're in Brussels, because the European Commission, through the uh, Pegasus Investigation Committee, has sent letters to Poland, to Hungary, and to Spain, and to Greece. I mean... 
it's not that they are not responding to us as defendant. The only country that hasn't yet responded to the European Commission is Spain. Uh, they should have written in full, and they haven't. Uh, in some countries, we don't know what they will say as an answer, but in Spain, there has been no answer. And regarding the second question, um, the person who said he felt pessimistic, and I, I understand him, if you start reading on how well the use of uh, IT tools uh, can be uh, used uh, in order to socially control people, uh, just like Orwell said, uh, dystopia of 1984, uh, some uh, society that one would think, um, well, offered no solution. That wasn't true. I think we have learned a lot uh, throughout the years. Uh, we have uh, um, erected ourselves as cyber activists. We know now that you have to protect your privacy uh, if you play this role. It has been so hard to uh, obtain this privacy uh, with this democratic struggle. And now we give for free our intimacy through Facebook and Twitter and all the social media. I think that we also need to apply this kind of digital resistance and to be able to know how to protect ourselves. But that's the paradox. Even the, the police reports themselves say that uh, uh, in some of their uh, operations, they're not able to obtain information because uh, the cell phones have been left 30 kilometers away from the meeting or because people have uh, turned off their cell phones, which is positive. It comes to show that people are more aware. But there's this neurosis going on, and there are some police states in which they consider that just turning off your cell phone uh, can be evidence of a certain crime. And I believe that uh, this kind of thoughts about democracy, technology, and the Leviathan from the internet is indeed a European problem. There are a lot of examples out there. Uh, I think Chloe already said this. In this part of uh, civilian uh, fights, they're quite long, they're exhausting, but in the end, they bear fruit. Probably much uh, later than what would one would expect. However, the mothers from Plaza de Mayo have uh, claimed this, uh, the only fight that is lost and the one that is abandoned. And they were just a handful of mothers. And we now know that the perpetrators of that repression have been tried and uh, sentenced. And I believe that it's uh, indispensable to know this as well and to learn about new democratic cultures also in our society that is so rich in terms of uh, civilian uh, democracy. We have experiences like XNet, which is a platform that uh, well educates us in this democratic cult uh, digital culture, as well as this uh, double-edged sword because Pegasus means that you have your own spy in your pocket and you're broadcasting your, li your, your life to everybody else live. And it's not just a movie, you know, it's our day to day. Do we have one more question? Also, I would like to remind the people joining online that they can also pose a question, but I see we have one yes. here. Yes, please. Um, now, okay, I, this is true. There's a very hypocritic uh, situation and, and behavior from the European Union when it comes to uh, what happens in Spain and when they look uh, and they take measures against, uh, for instance, Poland and, and Hungary. But if I'm not mistaken, uh, Viktor Orban, Hungary did the same with Pegasus and they, they, they used Pegasus also against uh, journalists and, 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 and human rights activists and everything. And if, I, if the information in the newspaper was correct, then I know that local organizations in Hungary took measures, well, they, they took the step to go to the uh, European Court of Human Rights. I don't know exactly what came out, but it would be very interesting to know what comes out, but because they cannot keep on saying that the situation in Hungary will still be like uh, a mistreating of human rights and that they say in Spain is not the case. I don't, I don't know. Is there somebody who is aware of that? No, I don't know. How could they do it so quickly? Because the problem with the European Court of Human Rights is that you have to exhaust internal remedies first. So I'm not aware, I, 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 but we, I, we, we can take a look at what uh, the it, civil it society time. organizations yeah, yeah, because the Hungarian case was uh, was made public in 2020 no if i'm not mistaken uh, yeah, with the whatsapp thing they are not done what do you mean the judgment from 
from the Hungarian kids in Hungary. Mm. Ah, okay. Okay, so this is ongoing. This is I think Probably they announced that will that they will take the case to the European Court of Human Rights, but mm, before taking it to the U European Court, you have to to go through a, a lengthy mm. internal process in the judiciary in, in your own country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Another question? Yes. But uh, we didn't mention the, the, that Pegasus was forbidden in the United States. <laughs> we are talking about the EU, but uh, at some point, and they are not using it in the States, or at least not directly. Yeah, just a comment. Uh, to exhaust all the procedures in a country is not a must, but it's normally, d uh, if you go directly, they will not accept your your your, your complaint on the you must have a very very good case and must be very urgent and important to do it otherwise otherwise they will not accept it david would you like to add something or no do we have another question then maybe I would uh, like to end sort of with one small question to Chloe. Um, so we have all these cases that we already know about and more cases uh, are being revealed by the day almost worldwide. Um, do you see this uh, raised attention or awareness hopefully um, at the European level um, as a, a site of hope that things will get better because we already know that we've um, We've we've known about spyware for for years now, but do you think this is like maybe a critical moment of crisis that will lead to change? I think it's also a question for Lisanda and David. Maybe they have they seem to have more hope in their uh, speeches than me. Um, <laughs> as I mentioned, like I like my worry is that the people who have are sorry the institutions, the actors that have the powers in their hands to do something they are reluctant to do it. Um, so the European Parliament can just like wave around, get energized about the topic, create some um, special committee, very ad hoc, but they're just able to do non-binding recommendations. Um, again, this is how it is in the EU treaties that only the commission can, re can actually initiate uh, legislation. Um, what was interesting and what we discussed before before the the event started uh, is that there are different um, sound or different um, voices in the European Commission in the press. So on the one hand, I, m I mentioned two commissioners saying it's not an EU competence. We don't intend to move on it. It's not our turf. Uh, there is enough. Like, what can we do? What do you expect from us? is purely national security. We're talking about intelligent services. The treaties are clear. The competence, this is exclusive competence from the member states. And those are from like uh, the commission, especially the commissioner for justice, Didier Renders, it's his portfolio. Um, so very disappointing. On the other hand, there was a, 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 a press statement uh, by another commissioner from Greece, uh, funnily enough, um, from the vice president on the European way of life, so rather attached to security issues, actually, from DG Home, like the uh, secret uh, directorate general for home affairs, so very security-related portfolio, who, which, uh, who said in the press it, it would be great that we have EU judicial guarantees against spyware. So there is hope, I think. There are some people who might start changing their minds in uh, the relevant institutions. And this is why keeping, as I mentioned, keeping the ball rolling helps a lot because if you s just let it settle and um, in dust, nobody's gonna do anything. And they're just gonna wait for time to, for general amnesia, <laughs> as I mentioned, to happen. And then we forget about this, um, and the activists get tired on the ground, uh, or they they fight without enough support uh, from the relevant institutions. So it's super important that we fight on all fronts. Judicial remedies are super important. Going to courts, filing lawsuits, uh, fundamental in this battle. 
it's also very important that we target our energy to advocacy to right towards the, the right institutions, the one that have powers to, to make a change. We just got one more. Uh, ah, David, would you like to? Yes. Yes, uh, thank you, Laura. Regarding the last question by a colleague who was thinking about the European possibilities without exhausting uh, national um, proceedings, I'm not a lawyer, probably a lawyer should be answering this, but in other um, realms, in other areas, we have uh, requested extra urgent uh, measures and Strasbourg has uh, said we were right, but not in the case of legal espionage. Um, I'm thinking about evictions, for instance, uh, for foreclosures. These were legal uh, cases with a legal sentence saying that 16 families are to be evicted. And then uh, you you could uh, request this kind of uh, measure, but we're um, an injunction, but we're not as advanced here. We're fighting against uh, shadows. And I'm just saying this. I know that a lot of lawyers from Omnion and from the ANC, everyone's very active in the legal sphere, um, but um, they have uh, ruled out this kind of preventive measures because they didn't think uh, they could uh, succeed as uh, an extraordinary mechanism, which does uh, exist in uh, Europe in specific cases. But in this case, we're fighting against shadows, as I was saying, and smoke. Um, I don't know what kind of request um, could be uh, raised uh, to the highest uh, courts of justice in, in Europe. Uh, well, the only possibility is for them to stop uh, spying on us. I don't know what kind of answer we would get. One more question online. Um, let's see if somebody wants to answer. Uh, how can the EU force Spain to answer the questions asked on the Pegasus issue? Uh, well, you mean the letter that has been sent? I think that in the end they will answer. <laughs> Normally, for instance, uh, uh, in the cases that they have received in the Human Rights Committee in the UN, and they they are very they they are very late in answering because it's a strategy to to make the cases uh, <laughs> longer. <laughs> But they, they are member state, and they will they will finally answer. Uh, another thing is what they are going to say. I, I can I cannot say it yet. Uh, it the only cases that uh, that um, we are uh, recognized are 18 cases, and they were authorized by the by the judge on the grounds of national security, and there were risks and against the rule of law and blah blah blah. No? What do you think, David? They will answer, yeah, that, no? <laughs> uh, obviously, they will answer that letter, and they are forced to do that. However, I believe that uh, they will write something similar to what they already wrote after the com Committee of um, official secrets within the framework of the Spanish Congress. They allowed MPs to be able to uh, read uh, some redacted documents when they confirmed that there were uh, 18 of them. And picking up what Chloe said, they will say, well, investigations as part of the strategy of a national uh, defense with a legal requirement, because in those 18 cases, uh, it had been acknowledged that there was a legal authorization um, of all kinds of uh, communication, messages, uh, everything. And that's it. That's what they will say. They will say it's for the for uh, national security, which is what usually countries uh, claim whenever there's an inner threat. But if that threat is a democratic political opposition out of 940 mayors in our country, 850 are pro-independent, it, it is a political conflict, not a problem of uh, national security. And uh, well, we have all shared many of these struggles and we know how uh, 
the degree of hypocrisy that many national governments can show, uh, especially in terms of uh, civil and political rights. We will see if uh, there's a committee being sent uh, to visit Spain, you know, that this is being prolonged. And for social movements, for democratic movements, regardless of what they think about uh, the independent Catalonia, uh, the Spanish presidency of uh, the European Commission uh, the second semester of 2023 will be exactly the time in which this Pegasus investigation will come to an end and it will be a right, the right time to denounce this, even though as I'm skeptic uh, that they will provide more information than the one they have already uh, provided. I think that they will use nice words uh, without uh, making any sense. So it's paradoxical because in Spain, the current government in place calls itself the most progressive government in history. Uh, one note on this, um, like, I'm, I don't know, I can't say for sure that they're gonna answer, like, from my point of view, they probably will, and they will probably also s say what you're describing in terms of, like, um, justification, they are a big weak. Um, but to stress again that the committee is not something that member states really welcome, um, you must know that the mission in Poland uh, by the Inquiry Committee of the European Parliament, PEGA, um, the government in the end refused to meet the delegation. So they were there, they met the media, they met the people affected, they met all kinds of actors, but no one from the government representative of the government for any from any ministry accepted to meet the delegation from this committee so it's it's not considered uh, by member states again it's a problem of like you why are you coming to us why are you investigating in our things in our ma in our affairs Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to wrap it up uh, now at this point uh, maybe just one more thing that I would uh, uh, like to say. There are a lot of frustrations, as we have clearly heard from our interventions, also from uh, from you. Um, we are walking against a lot of doors. Uh, there are a lot of issues. And um, the fear that I have also is that uh, what al always happens or often happens when there's so many scandals that you're um, developing this kind of fatigue to the topic and you, you think that you can actually not really do anything. But uh, I hope that uh, our speakers also gave you a little bit of hope that uh, we have to keep pushing and, and every little, hopefully, <laughs> will help. Well, thank you for coming and thank you so much uh, for the speakers to join us uh, tonight. <laughs>